Welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts, producer and host. On this episode, I'm happy to bring you a conversation with Sam Gregg, who's the director of research here at Acton. This week, we cover the life and work of Sir Roger Scruton. The world lost a giant in conservatism and philosophy when he passed away at the age of 75 on January 12th. Throughout his life, Scruton wrote approximately 50 books, and in 2016 was knighted for his contribution to philosophy and education. On this episode, Sam and I discuss the most important veins of his thought, especially those related to political philosophy and the arts. His work spanned so many subjects, like wine, hunting, music, and of course, conservatism. It's an impossible task to adequately cover all of his work in one podcast conversation, So while in this episode, Sam and I do dive into the most important elements of his work, I encourage you to watch some of Scruton's interviews after this episode or check out his books. I've linked some of my favorites in the show notes for this episode, and you can read those at blog.acton.org. That's blog.acton, A-C-T-O-N dot O-R-G. Here to talk with me about Roger Scruton's life and work is Sam Gregg, Director of Research here at Acton. Sam, welcome to the show. Caroline, it's good to be back with you. Now, there have been so many tributes written about Roger Scruton since his passing on January 12, and it is clear that he affected so many lives, either through his teaching or his writing. Who was Roger Scruton? Well, I think the fa- the most uh, the simplest way of describing Roger Scruton is that he's perhaps the most important conservative philosopher, conservative thinker, since the person who really founded modern conservatism, that being Edmund Burke. Uh, Scruton was a, a person who was interested in many things, but he came to prominence because he was really the first in the 19, I guess in the 1970s, to really articulate a type of philosophical statement of what it meant to be a conservative. Now, that sounds strange, I think, but what we need to remember is that between, I guess, Burke and the time of Roger Scruton, there were not many people who were writing down what it meant to be a conservative, as opposed to being a liberal or a socialist or a Marxist or a communitarian or any other number of political philosophical positions. And Scruton, particularly in the 1970s, in in his book, The Meaning of Conservatism, which was published first in 1980 was really the one who put down on paper in a philosophically but nonetheless accessible way what you might call conservatism as a political philosophy. That really is, I think, his greatest achievement. That's what he's most well known for. Now, I will say also that um, he was also, uh, in the eyes of many people, important because he was effectively persecuted for much of his life after he effectively came out as a conservative, a conservative thinker in the 1970s, because that meant, of course, challenging the dominant uh, left-wing, modern liberal philosophical position that more or less dominated the academy in his time. And of course, they dominate the academy today. But he was extremely important in terms of providing a philosophical alternative to those ways of thinking. So that's the essence of of Roger Scruton in in terms of his intellectual importance. He wrote on all sorts of things. He wrote, of course, on aesthetics, notions of beauty. Uh, He tried to underscore and develop what things like tradition meant. He was very active in creating a number of publications, most notably the Salisbury Review, which for a long time has been a major conservative political journal. He wrote about music, he wrote about sex, he wrote about literature, religion, etc. He even wrote novels and at least two operas, to my knowledge. But all that being said, he's most important as 
an articulator and defender of conservatism as a philosophical position. Later in our conversation, we will dive into what that means. But first, I would like to take our story back to 1968 in Paris. Take our listeners back to that time. Roger Scruton, when he is explaining when he first started cementing his philosophy on conservatism, usually starts in Paris in 1968. So can you tell us what was going on then? May 1968 was a very troubling time for not just France, but also uh, the Western world more generally. In May 1968, uh, Paris and French universities in general witnessed what I think is accurately called a type of student uprising. Uh, the Sorbonne was shut down, uh, De Gaulle's government came very close to collapsing, and the protests were driven very much by what you might ty- call a type of left-wing uh, Marxist liberationism. And Scruton was in Paris at the time, in May 1968, and he saw all this unfolding before him, literally in the streets. And he was very critical of this. He was critical of this because he said, first of all, they don't seem to have any alternative to what is in place. They seem to be primarily interested in tearing things down and less interested in explaining what fills the gap. But he also came to the insight at that particular point in time that just like Edmund Burke had noticed how the French revolutionaries were better at tearing things down, things down instead of putting things in place, he was very, became very conscious that one of the things about destroying things that you don't quite understand and you may regard as oppressive is that you often end up destroying many things that are important for liberty and order. And you don't realize you've done that until you understand that it's become impossible to put these things back together. So May 1968 is when Scruton has this type of, I guess you'd call it almost an existential experience, which went very contrary to what many people experienced in 1968, in May 1968, his reaction was very different from most people of a, of a similar age at that particular time. And that is when he starts consciously understanding himself to be a conservative and looking to build and articulate a philosophy that explains First of all, why this left liberationist mentality is so destructive, but also the importance of conservatives articulating a coherent philosophical response. Because conservatives have often, and still often are, reluctant to enter the world of philosophy, because that's often perceived as being too abstract, as being detached from the real world, things that conservatives have traditionally been suspicious of. But Scruton said, yes, we have reason to be worried about excessive abstractness. We have reason to worry about intellectuals and intellectualism in terms of the way they affect society. But it is incumbent upon conservatives to provide a coherent philosophical alternative. And May 1968, I think, explains why he took that power. Your explanation reminds me of... A statement that Scruton has made in an interview where he said that a conservative looks around him and sees things he would like to protect. And he says that basically a progressive would look around him and see things that perhaps need to be torn down and rebuilt in a different way, where uh, they look for meaning in shared projects. Um, your, uh, your statement earlier there reminded me of that. And he has also said that he believes conservatism is more of a posture than it is an understanding of policy prescriptions. And this seems so far removed from how we might think of being a conservative now. It seems you know, politics has informed our definition of conservatism rather than the other way around, rather than like you were saying, the philosophy, maybe the more abstract first principles of conservatism informing politics. Um, would you say that's accurate? Oh, yes, I would definitely say that is accurate, because what one notices among many conservatives today, and I, I see myself, for example, 
um, very much as a conservative. What you notice with a lot of conservative uh, uh, people, people who are involved in politics, people who are involved in policy, is that they are very driven by policy concerns and priorities. Now, Policy is extremely important. If you want to shift societies in particular directions, you need to think about um, the particular pieces of law or legislation or programs that you want people to buy into, accept, and even perhaps to vote for. But those policies must themselves be informed by a particular understanding of the world. And Scruton was very good at articulating that, what that should be from a conservative standpoint. If you read his his book on conservatism, which came out in 1980, it goes through all, in a very systematic fashion, all the points that he thinks conservatives need to think about when they're approaching policy questions. Because for Scruton, policy and politics themselves were mostly prudential subjects. So Scruton was not going to spend a lot of time arguing about whether the optimal minimum maximum tax rate should be 19% or 22%. He wasn't going to spend a lot of time thinking about the precise way in which a society uh, takes care of the poor, the handicapped, those who genuinely can't help themselves, etc. He thought that was important, but that wasn't his particular concern. His concern was with having the type of intellectual framework that ensures that one's credential judgments are informed by the types of principles that one wants if one is a conservative and one has a conservative vision of society. And That, to my mind, that's a good reason why you do need, if you're you're a conservative, if you're involved in the world of politics, if you're involved in the world of policy, it's extremely important to get these first principles correct. And, of course, Acton itself, this is one of the reasons we don't spend a lot of time talking too much about policy questions. We spend much more time talking about the sort of first principles, deeper philosophical, even deeper theological questions that need to be reflected upon before one starts talking about particulars of policy. You know, that makes me think that um, in ways, you know, Scruton really spoke a lot about how pragmatism in art has made it ugly in many ways. And it it makes me think there's maybe a similarity there between pragmatism um, poisoning art and pragmatism also infecting conservatism. Yes, because uh, a pragmatist, strictly speaking, is interested in what works, what makes things happen, how you concretely act in certain circumstances, given certain conditions, etc. The problem with being a pragmatist is that it means that you will often look away from the types of principles that will stop you from doing things that are either imprudent or downright evil. Uh, A very practical example might be something like, okay, we have an aging population. Uh, This is an enormous uh, drain on resources, et cetera, et cetera. A pragmatist, a strict pragmatist might say something like, well, this is easy. Let's just euthanize anyone over the age of 80. Now, That might solve your welfare problem, but as a matter of principle, you rule it out because it's wrong in itself. So to the extent to which pragmatism causes conservatives to look away from first principles, then it becomes a problem. Because I think one of the things we have to distinguish here is between pragmatism on the one hand and being prudential on the other, because they're two different things. Being pragmatic means that you literally do whatever it takes to achieve a a certain end. Being prudential means that you are conscious of certain restrictions, certain realities of the world in which we live, in which you apply the principles, 
But prudentialism means that you keep the principles in mind and you don't do anything that might end up in some way systematically violating some of the principles. So to the extent that conservatives, the right more generally, buy into pragmatism per se, then you can say that conservatism as a type of political movement, a philosophical outlook, will start to get put to the side, potentially corrupted, potentially put out of sight altogether. Now, I'd like to turn to Roger Scruton's work on beauty and aesthetics. Among some people, I would say he's maybe best known for that, for exploring questions like what it means for something to be beautiful, why beauty is important. In his BBC documentary called Why Beauty Matters, um, which is one of my favorite documentaries, and I will link it in our show notes, he says that, quote, Beauty is vanishing from our world because we live as though it did not matter. For Scruton, why was it so consequential that we make things that are beautiful? What real difference does it make? Well, I think one could say that anyone born after the 1940s must be looking around the world in some way and saying that clearly uh, we live in many respects an ugly world. Uh, one needs to look, just needs to look at modern architecture, modern church architecture. One looks at things around the world and says, you know, this, there's something alienating about this. We look, for example, at the high rises and skyscrapers in which many people were corralled in, as, as a matter of public housing in the 1960s, 1970s and 1980s. And we can see very, very concretely that that has hurt people's lives. It's actually considerably disrupted people's lives. It's given them a sense and a view of the world which is ugly in itself. Now, Scruton is not one of these people who said, well, we just have to build everything as if it was existed in 1385 or something like that. What he was saying is that there are things about the nature of beauty which speak to the human spirit things that reflect the goods that are part of our nature, which we can choose, we can assimilate into ourselves as a process of human action, that beauty in the sense reflects a type of order that is knowable to the human mind, and that we ought to build things around us that reflect those types of eternal truths, those eternal verities, rather than looking at the world in primarily utilitarian, pragmatic terms. It's not that Scruton was saying that we should be painting things or building things with no concern at all for expense, for modern utilities, etc. What he was saying is that we need to think about these things in the context of some of these broader principles. That's his approach to why he thinks beauty is important. And I think, as I said, you only need to look around the world today and you see some of the dreadfully ugly architecture, particularly church architecture, both internally and externally, and it does have an effect on the way that we live our lives and view the world. When we talk about his definition of beauty and how that's faded away from the arts in many ways, it seems like he was mostly nostalgic for something that is already lost. Would you say that in approaching these subjects, his posture was more hopeful or pessimistic? I think Scruton was essentially a hopeful person. Uh, He was not a dour type. Every time I met him or talked with him, he was always full of humor. Uh, He would have interesting asides to make. Now, that said, he was very conscious of the power of evil. He was very conscious of propensities to mediocrity. He himself experienced what it was like when you crossed modern liberals and the left, when you challenged some of their sacred totems, etc. He himself uh, personally experienced a great deal of rejection, trouble, career in uh, career undermining actions on the part of those of whom he was critical of. So in the one sense, he was hopeful because he thought there were these eternal truths, that people in every generation exist to understand these eternal truths, moral truths, political truths, economic truths, ascetic truths, 
And every generation has those people, even in societies as dour and ugly as those that existed in communist Eastern Europe. Even in those societies, you could find what you might call points of light around which civilizational renewal could occur. At the same time, he was very aware of the power of evil, what he would, he would not hesitate to call the impact of sin upon the world. So I think what you have in the case of Scruton, is a type of hopeful realism about society's ability to understand what's wrong and to correct it. Now, you knew Scruton quite well. When did you first meet him? I met him in the 1990s when I was doing my doctorate at Oxford. He came and spoke at Oxford at a particular event. I can't, can't quite remember what it was. But I distinctly remember, remember talking to him afterwards and thinking, right, I need to know more about him. Uh, I had read his book, The Meaning of Conservatism, as many people had uh, in, at that particular point in time, in terms of understanding what was happening to the right broadly conceived uh, in Britain, America, and the West more generally. Uh, so intellectually, that's when I first started to encounter him, and I met him in the 1990s. And then on and off, I'd see him at particular conferences. And what was interesting about that were the variety of events that he would be at. So I remember, for example, seeing him and speaking to him at length at a conference that had to do with rethinking uh, management and business schools. Now, you might ask, what on earth was he doing there? Well, he actually had some interesting things to say about economics. Uh, when it came to political philosophy, it was, I was often in, it was often the case that I'd run into him at a conference or a seminar that had to do with any number of political philosophical questions. So my encounters with him were sporadic, but they occurred over a very long period of time. Uh, and of course, I had the pleasure of inviting him to come and speak at an Acton Institute conference uh, back in 2016. And this was just after had, he had been knighted. And I made the point of introducing him by saying that it was a knighthood that was very much deserved, but also well overdue. In looking back on your interactions with Scruton, do any particular moments come to mind that really stand out to you or that you really cherish? Well, I think a broad one, which I think captured many of the different interactions I had with him, was his generosity of spirit. Because it wasn't as if everyone in the room necessarily agreed with him. And that includes gatherings of conservatives, classical liberals, uh, to talk about things ranging from markets, to politics, to law, to aesthetics, etc. Because uh, I think it's quite well known that there are lots of disagreements among conservatives and classical liberals and others about these particular types of subjects. And what always struck me was that he would always look for points of engagement with people who he disagreed with, and then he would state why he disagreed with them. So his point was not to get into an exercise whereby he would just simply demolish someone with whom he disagreed. He was always looking for points where he could affirm what the other person was saying, but then also point out where he thought that they were wrong. The other thing, of course, was, which was very remarkable about him was his great sense of humor. And it got him into trouble sometimes because uh, he was not politically correct and he, wasn't, he had no hesitations about saying uh, politically incorrect things at, at all sorts of gatherings where uh, sometimes that wouldn't necessarily be appreciated. So that willingness to engage and that sense of humor, I think, were two of the things that most struck me whenever I was in, in some type of seminar or conference or some other encounter at which he was present. How do you believe Roger Scruton has changed the direction of conservatism? Well, for the first thing, the first thing I would say is that he gave conservatism a type of philosophical backbone, which I think, as I mentioned, had been lacking for a very uh, long time. Uh, that I don't think can be underestimated. I think another uh, thing for which he'll be uh, remembered and celebrated for a very long time is his ability to bring together a whole range of different disciplinary backgrounds and outlooks and integrate them into a whole. 
He was, for example, extremely familiar with economics and economic science. He knew Adam Smith. He knew the writers of the 19th century. He knew more contemporary 20th century thinkers like Friedrich von Hayek or Mises and all these people. And he was quite comfortable talking about those things, even though he wasn't particularly interested per se in economics. But he was so erudite in so many areas that he could sit down at a type of uh, I don't know, a philosophy economics conference, and you wouldn't know that it was something that he wasn't that interested in. But his ability to bring these different things together, to show, for example, how aesthetics matters for politics, or why politics and your view of politics will shape the way that you think about economic questions, or the way in which the answers that you give to particular philosophical queries will shape the way that you think about economics, the way that you think about the nature of government, the way that you think about civil society, the way that you think about concepts of citizenship and even religion. So that ability to bring these things together, I think, was um, almost unparalleled in many ways, because we do live in a world in which much of the academy insists on specialization. Now, specialization is important, particularly when it comes to something like economics, but different points that knowledge needs to be related to other subjects. And that, I think, is something that Roger Scruton was particularly good at doing, both in terms of speaking, but also in terms of the almost 50 books I think he wrote during his lifetime. Roger Scruton's last words were, quote, coming close to death, you begin to know what life means. And what it means is gratitude, unquote. I think most of us who appreciated Scruton's work can say that whether or not we always agreed with him, we're thankful that he continually pointed people back to goodness and truth and beauty through his life. Thank you, Sam, so much for coming on. Caroline, it was great to be with you. Thanks for having me on. As always, thank you so much for listening today. Our podcast team loves putting this show together for you every week, and it's so encouraging to hear back from our listeners. Feedback is super important to me because it lets me know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most, and also how I can improve this show to make sure you're getting the most out of it. You can reach our team at actinline at actin.org, or you can call our office at 616-454-3080. And if you like our show, you know what to do. Leave us those ratings and reviews on the Apple Podcast app and subscribe. Act in Line is on YouTube, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you listen.